It should be with you now. On your okay. WhatsApp. WhatsApp, okay. Okay, I did, you didn't send this by email. You didn't. But it's okay. I've got it now. It's it. I just downloaded it from your email, but it's okay. We're there. Okay, that's fine. Okay, ready to go. Yeah, if you want to share your screen, you share it. I'm not ready yet. One second. Um, hold on. Doc, can you move somewhere where we can see your face? Oh, okay. Can you not see my face? No, it's not very clear. I want it to be as clear as Dr. Buma's face. Right, okay. Out. Basically, once the comment comes in, yeah, you will see it. Just play around it so you see something like this. Yeah? So you just like the comment and basically if you can't comment, you comment it now. Just leave it. All right, uh, we can start now. Okay, can you would you take the screen off later? So I'll be uh, full screen. Okay. Um Stephanie. Yes, yes starting now. So you can uh, take the screen and I'll pay me. Hello, welcome everyone, and very, very good evening to you all. Uh, just a quick housekeeping. If you're not talking at this moment, could you please just mute your laptop, mobile phone, or whatever device you're joining us with? This is so that we have uh, a smooth uh audience and then uh, with lesser interruption so please if you're not talking kindly please mute your device it should be very helpful uh i want to say welcome to everyone joining us this evening from wherever you're joining from especially from the people from south end the people who are joining us from nigeria from london from us and i, I know a couple of people that is logging on from canada Good to have you on board. And uh, my name is Kemi Tomide Johnson. I am the founder and the chair of Climax Family Hall, uh, an organization set up to strengthen family values and to empower parents, especially to be able to support their younger people to become a better self, to create a safer family where children can grow and maximize their potential. We all know that setting up a family institution is no joke. It requires a lot of hard work. But at the back of hard work comes something we call mutual respect and the ability to uh, self-sacrifice for one another. But we do know that these days is something that is quite challenging, especially in the, in the face of what we encounter migrating into this part of the world uh, there's a lot of things that has been happening lately in regards to domestic violence and how it's impacting on our young people, especially within the community that we belong to, which is the African community. The lack of cultural understanding and the cultural clash, especially migrating uh, into this part of the world, we know that it does impact on a lot of people, uh, either parenting style or the way we relate with each other as husband and wife. So for us to be able to create a safer environment for us as individuals and for the sake of our children, uh, where we can all grow and thrive, it is important that we bring to you and we engage in the conversation around domestic violence and mental health and how we can better strengthen ourselves to be better parents to raise better children, we have the adults and the mantles are in our hands. We, we, it's whatever we give out that our children are going to be getting from us. COVID has uh, also created a new wave 
of pressure on host parents, especially, especially with kids being out of school and us being in, you know, in the more like an incubator, a semi hostile environment, having to stay inside all through for the past six months, something none of us, I believe, has experienced before. But going forward, we believe we can do better. We can change the narrative. We can live happier family. We can live a more healthier, you know, family and raise better children. Our, we are here to say we can do things differently. We can raise children who are gonna go on in the future to be better leaders, to change our world and to transform themselves into the best God wants them to be. And that is by empowering ourselves to the right knowledge of being uh, a co-spouse or you know, a relationship or husband or wife or whatever you want to call it, and to be a better parent to her children in helping them to be the best they can be. And so this evening, I have wonderful people among us, specialists in their own right. They are people who are passionate about families. They are people who are passionate about young people development. We have Dr. Ajayi, is a psychiatrist, a consultant, and we have Dr. Bomo, a consultant psychiatrist as well. We have uh, Peace, who is uh, a social worker, is highly, she's highly qualified, and we have a mental health advocate with us tonight in the name of uh, Reverend Lade Olubemi. We is going to be facilitating and, you know, navigating us through the evening. I hope you get your notebook, you get your pen, because at the end of the day, we are not just speaking to you alone. We are expecting you to cascade this information into the community, because we can't do it alone, and we cannot afford to keep the knowledge and the understanding that we'll gain this evening to ourselves. Because at the end of the day, family is not just the people we live with. It is the people our children meet up in school. It's, they are the people also who we meet in churches, the people we meet in the supermarket. The Africans always believe that we are a community and we thrive when we all come together. So please get yourself ready and prepared for a night of buffet and get as much as possible tonight. Don't forget also to ask questions when they are speaking. If there's anything you think they need to shed more light on, or you don't understand, or you think you know somebody or someone who may be impacted or may have been affected by one of the issues that will be raised tonight, please do speak to them. Ask questions. We will give you enough room to express yourself. But most importantly, stay connected and stay tuned. Don't be distracted. And we want to see at the end of this, if you have any feedback or anything that you think that we can use to better improve our services to you, please do leave it also to us via the email, which I'll be leaving in comments also. And also you can use it, leave us uh, your uh, feedbacks via the link that you have the codes for this event with. I'm gonna be leaving you to Reverend Lade, who is gonna be charging the evening. But before I go, I'll be joining you later. But for now, I wanna say thank you so much for taking the effort and the time to register and to be part of this event. This event is sponsored by A Better Start South End. And I'll say to you, check up their, uh, their website and try to connect with them, especially if you live locally around South End. And I know that you are not alone. Don't keep quiet. That is the song we are singing tonight. If you are experiencing domestic violence, if you know that you are facing a challenging situation in your family, or you know somebody who is going through some meltdown or challenges mentally or something, some form of anxiety, which all of our speakers are gonna to be touching on tonight. Please don't keep quiet, reach out. And I promise you, help is always out there for you. Just don't keep quiet and God will help us all. So please stay tuned and I start welcome Reverend Lade to take over from me. And if you're watching us from Facebook, 
please stay connected, leave your comments, and we will get them treated, especially your questions. Thank you so much for this evening. And we, uh, and we, uh, we hope for it mm. tried. Don't let me talk too much. You're gonna be having me later. All right then, thank you. See you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, um, Kemi. It is an honor, it is a privilege to be facilitating this juggernaut. Um, this no is, I've got two psychiatrists, one social worker, and um, yes, discussing a topic that is absolutely close to my heart and close to all of our hearts, and that is domestic violence, one, and then there's mental health, two. Oftentimes when we talk about domestic violence, um, the first thing people usually jump at is looking at the, the victim. Um, sometimes they look at the perpetrator from the angle of how will the law, how will the criminal justice system deter the perpetrator from continuing in that act or in that type of behavior. Um, we don't sometimes look down and think about the long-term effect that that victim or even the perpetrator, <laughs> the long-term effect that the victim and even the perpetrator may be going through. So this evening, I'm not going to be talking too much. Um, yes, I'm a mental health first data. Thanks for the introduction. But however, we have clinicians in-house. These are people who they sit down and they have observed, they have worked with those who are victims of domestic abuse and sometimes their children as well. The effect of domestic abuse is immense. It is not just on the victim alone. There is a ripple effect, what you call a secondary vicarious trauma that the immediate family and sometimes the extended family sometimes go through. Those are the things we're going to be looking, talking about this evening. And I just want to say, well done, Kemi, well done, Climax Family Hub for putting this together, a very much needed conversation in this very dire time, absolutely needed. We've all been locked in in our homes for the past four or five months. Yes, the lockdown measures are a little bit eased out, but we know that a lot of us, life can never be the same. A lot of offices are not going back to work as they used to do before. I know in my office, for example, we're not going back to our office building. We're moving somewhere else. Most organizations are downsizing and they're coming down to just about a third of their workers going back into the office. The long-term effect of that is that a lot of us will be working from home. The long-term effect of that is that there's going to be a lot of interaction with people who are at home. And the word we're saying is domestic violence. Domestic. Domestic means within the home violence or abuse within the home. We're going to be using the word domestic violence this evening. However, we'd just like to say that when we say violence, it includes abuse as well, because oftentimes people think that when you talk about violence, it's not until you have hit someone, until you have broken their skin, until somebody has a broken bone. So sometimes people think, oh, well, he has not beat you, so it's not an abuse. No, an abuse, sorry, he has not hit you, so it's not, a, it's not violence, no. A financial, a sexual, an emotional form of abuse is violence as well, because violence has been meet to that person. So on the panel this evening, we have a very strong, um, um, I know, Ken, you've introduced them already, but I'd just like to kind of go through the housekeeping rules again. Please mute your devices. For those who are watching us on Facebook, we very much would like to get your questions. Can you please put your questions down? Because we're going to actually have a question and answer session where, we, where whatever questions you put up there, we will be sharing them. We'll be, we'll be asking our panelists here. I'm going to do my presentation later. But I'm just going to quickly bring on, before I talk too much, I don't like to talk too much. People say I talk too much, but I don't like to talk too much. I'm going to be uh, bringing on Dr. Boma. Tokumbo Francis, she's the first person who's going to be presenting now. And she has a PowerPoint that she'll be sharing with us. And for those who are in-house in the studio, I like to call it studio because they're all in the studio. This is a virtual studio. If you have any questions while they're delivering their presentations, could you just put them in the chat section? The chat box is the second box on the bottom. If you look on the bottom of your screen, you see the chat. So if you click on it, type your questions there. We'll take all the questions later. Thank you. 
Over to you, Boma. Boma, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> thank you very much, Reverend, and thank you very much, um, Kemi, for inviting me to this very interesting topic, which I am very interested in and I see day to day in my practice as a psychiatrist. So the topic is domestic violence in the family setting, which is a very, very wide topic, but I'll try and summarize it as best as I can. So before we start, um, um, sorry. Uh, before we start, I will um, first try and define or talk about what domestic violence is. So domestic violence, in the family, what we understand as a family. Like um, Kemi said initially, she said family. In Africa, we're very family orientated. And there's so many different definitions of family. Family can be a group, group of people living or going through the world together. And in this modern day time, we have different types of family. We have the nuclear family, which is mom, dad, and children. Now, because of what is happening in the world, we have step families, we have grandparents living with us, we have um, extended family. So the family is now a very, very big unit. And we also know that we, my main topic, uh, we're talking about the effects on children. And we know that children, what a, a baby, when it comes to the world, the first person he knows is a family. And most of the things children learn is through their family. So what is domestic violence? Or what, what do we understand by domestic violence? So um, domestic violence, um, it's any violence or abuse. And we're talking in the, in the family setting, in a domestic setting. It can be committed by a partner, ex-partner, family member. It can also take place in heterosexual or same-sex relationship. So the definition, according to the 2011 Instable Convention, defines domestic violence, which it means all acts of physical, sexual, psychological, economic violence that occur within the family or domestic units, or between former or current spouses or partner, whether or not the perpetrator or shares the same residence as the victim. That's according to the um, convention in 2011 Istanbul Convention. And anybody can be a victim of domestic violence, regardless of your age, gender, ethnicity, or, 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 or age, gender, or any, anybody can be a, a victim. So there's so many types of domestic violence. And um, Reverend had talked touched on a, a few. Most of, most of the time when we think of domestic violence, we think of physical. So they're very, I'll summarize it. We have physical type of abuse. We have the verbal, we have emotional, we have economic, we have religious, and we have sexual. And physical is when someone intentionally harms or causes injury to the person. So that one, we see broken bones or we see bruises. Verbal abuse or emotional abuse, someone, being very critical of you, or very hostile to you, a destructive form of communication, always putting you down, lack of respect. Um, also, it can happen on social media when people try and bully you or intimidate you and use um, social media to manipulate or intimidate you. In, and we also have economic or financial abuse in which the abuser denies the victim access to their money or it's very controlling, no, you can't buy this unless, I'm, unless I agree or to withhold funds from, from the person. Religious abuse, which is a very big topic. It's people are abused under the disguise of religion, where your pastor will say, you're, you're not supposed to do this, or before you do this, you need to get permission from the pastor or the cleric or whoever is the head of the um, organization. So religious abuse includes harassment, humiliation, and um, most of the time these uh, clerics abuse their position. Sexual abuse, sexual abuse is more explicit when you do not agree or the, the, if the person does not need to have sexual dealings or intercourse or with the with abuser. If someone, uh, I mean inappropriate touching is also part of uh, part of sexual abuse. 
uh, in, during this pandemic period, we the, it has been on the news that domestic, the rates of domestic abuse has really risen. And because we were locked up in the same, people were locked up in the same room with abuse. And this became very um, important. I mean, the government has been speaking about it a lot because in the first three weeks of lockdown, that's from March 23rd to 12th of April, 14 women were killed. Um, two children were also killed as a result of um, domestic abuse. Um, the problem in this uh, African and Asian or my, uh, ethnic minority is that it's underreported in our society because of the negative effects, the police, they say, oh, how can you report your spouse or your partner or anyone who's abusing you? And it has a ripple effect. The pastor will say, no, you pray about it. And um, that's a reason why it's underreported in African and ethnic minorities. And what we're saying is that abuse is abuse. You need to report it and get out of the situation and find what to do. Okay. So we'll just quickly go, because I have a few things to talk about. Signs. Um, how will you know if someone has been abused? Physically, if the person is a victim of um, physical abuse, you can see bruises, um, person, poor hygiene, inappropriately dressed for the weather, sometimes to cover their bruises in the hot weather, you see them wearing jackets and everything just to cover their bruise. There may be signs of malnutrition if the person is abused and not given food or not given access to food, nutrition, bruising burns. You can also see defensive burns or injury on the forearm like carpet burns when the person is trying to um, escape from the abuser. Also, if the person is abused, when the abuser comes in, you see an air of silence and the abuser, the, the, the victim is afraid to talk, becomes very withdrawn, can't sleep, low self-esteem, either weight gain or weight loss. Hello, signs, physical injuries on the victim's bodies, I've spoken about that, excuse. Then the victim starts giving an excuse, oh, I fell or I hit my head, I was drunk. Then also the victim, the work becomes um, missing work, missing school. Um, there's also, there can be a personality change. When the, the abuser is around, the victim becomes very jumpy and nervous when the victim is around or when the perpetrator is around, the victim is unable to talk, lack of independent communication, always looking towards the person for, for support or agreement. The victim might also blame themselves that, ah, no, it's my fault, I'm the one. And they, they can also abuse drugs. So we we're talking about this cultural effect on um, the, the cultural aspect of domestic abuse. In various cultures, what they term as domestic abuse varies. In some cultures, if a wife doesn't obey their husband, um, they're beaten and people, is, people agree and say that's normal, that's not normal, or that's okay. Wife beating is acceptable in some cultures, especially if the wife is disobedient, but what we're trying to highlight now that that's wrong. Sometimes the yeah. husband- He was on, on mute today. Hello? I mean, more muted. In extreme case, you know, have. Can I ask that we all the uh, devices, please, apart from the speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. In some cultures, like I was saying, in some Not cultures. More. In some cases, in extreme cases, there are honor killings in which people justify that, yes, what the man did was right. The woman was. Um, disobedience. Also, we know a lot about female genital mutilation, which is a form of abuse um, in all cultures. But is in some cultures, it 
acceptable. Now I'll just talk about the cycle of abuse, um, which is by Leonor Walker. So the, he says there are four phases of abuse. When the victim knows that something is going to happen, there's a lot of tension at home. And the person says, oh yes, I know I'm going to get a whacking today because I've said this or I've done this. Then there's the incidents. And then in the reconciliation, the abuser or the perpetrator becomes very nice, buys her gifts, flowers, chocolates, say, no, I, uh, uh, what I've done was wrong. I'm really sorry. And there's the harm face in which the victim now starts to rationalize and say, maybe it was really my fault. Maybe he's going to change. And that's the kind of cycle we want to break that once, unless the abuse, the perpetrator uh, gets help, it's usually very difficult to break this cycle. So I want to say who, which kind of people or who, which kind of people are, are perpetrators of this crime? Like I said in the beginning, we'll start from childhood. What a child sees, he learns and believes it's normal. So most, in most cases, most of the perpetrators have also either witnessed abuse as a child or maybe witnessed his parents abusing or his, mother, his father abusing his mother either way and accepts that's normal. So much women are not to be heard. Um, men, anything a man or your brother says is right, is right. Some other victims, perpetrators have been exposed to violence. Sometimes, like we know, we're talking about domestic abuse in a family setting. Financial problems, financial issues can also trigger abuse. Sometimes when the women, woman, woman is earning more than the men, that can trigger abuse. I'm not saying in all cases, but in some cases, there's, there's a lot of literature on that. Drug abuse, um, alcohol, and also mental health problems, um, schizophrenia, bipolar, they all, they may. I mean, if the person is becoming unwell and the person becomes very paranoid, that oh, my wife is seeing someone or my wife is doing this, then um, they can be perpetrators of the crime. So what can we say about what will happen to these victims? There's a long list of things that can happen to these victims. First, when you're constantly being put down, you develop low self-esteem. The person may be anxious. Also, they may develop mental health problems like they have depression, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And domestic violence can also affect their relationship with others. So we're going to talk of the effect of domestic violence in children. So we're talking, uh, we'll start from preschool. If the child is young and has witnessed domestic violence, I mean, if they've reached their normal- You have two minutes more, doctor. Two minutes, okay. I'll rush. <laughs> okay. Things like bedwetting, thumb sucking, crying, not sleeping well in preschool. In school age, they might feel guilty. They might blame themselves. Come to school, stomach ache, and teens may act out and they keep protected self, low self esteem, start bullying, become withdrawn, and um, come start bullying, and also start um, acting out. So what we are saying, what we're trying to say, is that domestic violence is we say no to the domestic violence in the family setting. First, if you are a victim or experience that there are so many places you can ask for help. If you're in immediate danger, call 999 and the police are always ready to help. That you can confide in someone you trust. And there are also organizations, which I know another person is going to speak about. And another thing I forgot to ask, um, mention is that Every 30 seconds, we've been, I've been talking for about 15 minutes. Every 30 seconds, the police, the police receive a call regarding domestic violence. So it is very, very um, common. It's more, com it's as more common than we think it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much, Dr. Bono. Thank you very much. That was excellent delivery. Um, I like the way that you looked at it. It's a holistic looking at it. It's what are the signs? What are the different types of domestic abuse? 
I like the way you ended it, and that is the statistics around the fact that every 30 seconds, yes, in the United Kingdom, there is a call to the police about somebody suffering or somebody being abused. And that is why the topic today is really important. When you look at the number of, of um, the, the, the population of the United Kingdom, that will give you an idea that that is a lot. And I'll just quickly like to read the statistics out so that we know the impact and the severity of this topic. And that's why we cannot toy with it because a lot of people are walking around being abused and they don't know. In fact, some people do not even know that it's abuse, especially when it is emotional abuse or financial abuse. Some people have no insight into what they're going through. And that's why this topic is really, really important. And of course, also give us hope. Hope in the sense that yes, we recognize that there's a problem out there, or also the fact that there's solution, the organizations like Cl Climax Family Hub, who are working, and I know Peace is going to be talking about that later. But I'll just quickly read through that, these statistics so that you would understand what we're talking about. The latest figure from the Crime Survey for England and Wales shows little change in the prevalence of domestic abuse in recent years. Yes, we've had so many talks, we have so many people who've talked, so many organizations campaigning against domestic abuse, but you know what? It's still out there in the community. In the year ending, and this is a figure from the Office of, the Nas of National Statistics, in the year ending March 2019, an estimated 2.4 million adults aged from 16 to 74 experienced domestic abuse. From that 2.4 million adults, 1.6 million were women, and hold on, 786,000 were men. That is in one year, were men. So when we talk about domestic abuse, we often jump quickly to think that it is women alone that are abused. We're here to tell you as well that men are abused as well. It is not just the women. So let's balance the equation so that people can speak out. Um, the police recorded 746, 219 domestic abuse related crimes in the year. That is in 20, two, 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 um, 2018 to 2019. And that's an increase of 24% from 2017 and 2018. 24% is quite a high number. We have a work to do on our hand, people. And that is why putting this conference together is absolutely apt, very, very apt. The police made an arrest and listen to this, hear this. This is where we need to be very conscious and be very much aware of what is going on. And the reason why I would have expected the police to be here, to be honest, because this statistics I'm going to read now actually does affect them. So the police made an arrest of 32, um, 32 arrests, but 100 domestic abuse related crimes. So if there were 100 cases, if there were 100 reports that they had, there were only 32 arrests. And that shows a 32% arrest rate, and most of them are usually discharged. And they go on. There is an angle that I would like us to talk about later when I'm going to be talking, when I'm going to be doing my own presentation around perpetrator management. This is one area that I'm very, very passionate about because a lot of the perpetrators have issues, underlying issues. They are, like Dr. Bomer said, some of them have actually witnessed abuse themselves. And all they know in their life is to, they witness abuse. They've seen when their father wants to talk to their mother, it is a slap. So they feel that it's okay as a man to slap a woman to get your point across. It's okay as a woman to shout to your husband. So the women grow up as well and they're shouting at their husband and they're abusing their husband emotionally, verbally. Devil abuse is one area that we should never ever overlook because those words are really, really important. I'm going to be handing you over now to Dr. Ayodele Ajayi. He's a consultant psychiatrist, and he's going to be telling us about how to identify and support mental well-being of children. And we're saying children, children, children. The reason why we're talking about children is trauma. <laughs> trauma is one area that we don't often recognize or pick up when an incident happens. How do we recognize the signs and how do we support young adults and also children that may be living or may have witnessed domestic abuse. I hand you over now to Dr. Ayodele Ajayi. Please welcome Dr. Ayodele Ajayi. It's okay for you to clap, it's all right, don't worry. We're in the virtual room. <laughs> 
thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Reverend um, Lade. And also thank you very much um, for that very engaging presentation, Dr. Francis. Uh, just to um, do a quick recap, uh, Dr. Francis has very eloquently presented the case about what domestic abuse is. She's told us, um, uh, really she started by telling us about what the family is, which is a very important thing because we know that domestic, it's not domestic abuse, except it's, it's happening in the context of a family unit, either for, from ex-partners or people who are still living within the family. Um, she's told us about what abuse is, the, the, the cycles of abuse. She's also told us um, the warning signs, the things to look out for so that we can help other people. In addition, um, she's also very, raised a very important point about the cultural and um, spiritual aspects how those dynamics play out and how um, our spiritual beliefs, um, our, our cultural beliefs can actually sometimes hinder people from getting help, which is very um, disheartening. And um, she's actually ended on a very high note telling us that every 30 seconds, the police receive a call for help relating to domestic abuse. And that's where I want to um, 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 continue because um, domestic abuse um, is actually a very common thing um, we know that, for instance, uh, statistics also show that one in four women in their lifetime would experience domestic abuse. That's 25% of women. That means that if you go to Tesco's and you just take an arbitrary, you start counting one to four, one to four, on the average, you're expecting that for every four you count, one woman in her lifetime would experience um, domestic abuse. That's, that's a, a very high figure. We also know that on the average, 240 women call the National Domestic Abuse Helpline every single day. The implication of that is that in every hour, in every hour, um, there, is a, uh, that, there are 10 calls from women to the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. The implication of that is that every six minutes, there is a call. And, and it's just to tell you the, the magnitude of what we are dealing with here. So really my, my title tonight is to, um, what are the things that we can do? How can we identify and support um, people, um, children, particularly children, young adults who are witnessing domestic violence and who, um, who are witnessing domestic abuse? And just following on from what um, Reverend Lade said, it's very important to recognize children and um, young adults who are witnessing domestic abuse. Um, or domestic violence, they are not the recipients, they're just secondary recipients of it. But it's very important to recognize them because they are as traumatized as people who are involved. And the other thing to note is that sometimes we forget when we look at the victims of domestic abuse, we only look at the people who are directly involved. We forget the children who are also in the womb because even statistics show, um, research shows us that even children who are in the womb can sense um, can sense hostility towards their mothers. And they can, even as a result of that, because of the stress of the mother, that can be passed on to them. And they can, or in fact, suffer uh, mental difficulties after they are born, even though they were pregnant when all of this happened. The other thing we need to bear in mind about even children and um, young adults witnessing domestic abuse and domestic violence also is that they don't actually need to see it. You know, some people, some women say, oh, I'm staying in the marriage for my children. Or I'm staying, I, I, I'm not saying, I, I'm not here to advocate that people should stay or people should leave, but I'm just presenting the facts. I'm saying that some women also say, oh, um, my children don't see it. But the reality is that children don't need to see it. They can hear it or they don't even need to hear it. They can sometimes sense it. Children know when there's hostility around, they know when there's tension and they can actually pick up on those things. So it's really very important that um, we take this very seriously. So what are the things that, what are the things to, um, to look out for? The first thing I want to say is that, you see, usually when abuse occurs, it's because the, the family is under some sort of um, stress or, or tension or the other. Um, and we know that when there's stress in a family that outweighs the support that the family is receiving, then various things happen and abuse is one of the things that happen. We also do know that it's important to identify these things early because early support and intervention for families and carers um, could actually be a saving factor. It could save the future of young people. So what are the things um, 
to really look out for what are risk factors. Um, as Dr. Francis has already said, mental illness in the family is one key thing to look out for. Um, also very closely linked to that is learning disability. You see anything that puts, a pre that puts pressure or stress on the family system, is, it, it, those are areas to be looking out for that. Could abuse be going on? Could there be children in this family who are actually witnessing abuse and who are witnessing domestic violence? Social isolation, um, families that have just come in, um, they've been living in Africa, they've been living um, elsewhere, or they've been living elsewhere in Europe, they newly relocated to the United Kingdom, um, they don't know the system well, they don't have any social support, they feel excluded. Some of them are not even entitled, um, they are on um, they are the group that we re refer to as nil recourse to public funds. They are not entitled to any benefits, there's poverty, there's problems, there's um, financial problems, all of that cause tension. And all of that, those are the places to be looking. Substance misuse has been uh, highlighted. We know that 45% um, of the uh, serious case reviews that were, that were, um, that were looked at, uh, the Department of Health in 2002 said that 45% of cases of, um, of, of, um, of cases so that involve- um, Sorry, can you please mute you your devices as you're coming in, please? Please mute your devices, thank you. Right. So 45% of cases that involved um, serious case reviews of um, involving children, 45% of them actually involved um, substance misuse or alcohol in the background. So those are the things to really be looking out for because the reason I'm saying this is, it's not just about those who are involved, it's not just who are, those who are in the forefront of it, but we all have to be our brother's keepers. We all have to be looking out there and looking at the symptoms and looking to see whether there are children who are vulnerable or there are children who are actually um, who are actually victims because we see these children children in church we see them in, in religious play organizations we see them in mosques some some of the of, of course see them on our in our neighborhood and there are warning signs to um, actually look out for like i've said um parental mental illness is one of them we know that 33 to 75 percent of parents whose children are known to social services actually have a mental difficulty uh, so in terms of what are the other warning signs, what are the things that you can see in those children? One of them is that those children, my, my, um, those children might have regression, what we call regression. That is, they begin to do the things that they should have outgrown, like uh, so sucking their thumb, like, um, thumb, like, um, like even bed wetting. Uh, they can be clingy. You can find that those are the type of children that may also not want to return home when they go to, to places. Maybe they go to the sports club or they go to church. They, they are those who are, when it's time to go, usually children should want to go back home. But because of the crisis that is happening at home, because of the violence that they witness at home, sometimes they don't want to return home. Um, these are the type of children that sometimes as well, they begin to resort to cutting themselves. Self-harm is a common thing. Sometimes as well, children become rebellious because of the things that they are witnessing at home, particularly the boys are likely to respond with rebellion. Um, they become naughty. Um, some of them will go into drugs and alcohol use. And this is just a cry for help. They are trying to say that there's something going on. Some of them, their school grades will deteriorate. A child who has been doing really very well at school will suddenly begin to do, uh, perform poorly. Um, they be, they, and sometimes that's where they begin to bully other people because that's what they've seen their dad to, to do to their mom. So those are things to really look out for um, in terms of the warning signs. Uh, the other thing is that they might be withdrawn. They might be socially withdrawn. Um, they might not wa want to mix with other people because of the sense of shame, because of the feeling of guilt. So what are the things that we can do to help these young people? The first thing I think is that identification. It's very important for us to be able to identify that is there something going on? And the way to identify these things is to have a, what we call a high index of suspicion. Basically, we need to be alert. In our communities, we need to be alert. And that looks and that, that cuts across board. I'm talking to religious leaders here. I'm talking to community leaders. I'm talking to, um, to, to people who work in the community, anyone who works with children, anyone who has a neighbor, anyone who is a member of the African community, of the Black community. We should be looking out for these symptoms. And, and when we see them, we should be able to know how to raise um, safeguarding a lot. Um, I know that um, um, that's not really my remit today and that a social worker will be coming on to give us the details about that very shortly. 
So it's very important that we, we, we are on the alert and that we know what to do when we feel that there's something happening that we need to further investigate. Um, in terms of we, the other thing that we could do to help these children is that we need to help them to feel safe. A child who is witnessing domestic violence and domestic abuse, either of their dad or their mom, feel unsafe. And when children feel unsafe, they carry that internal model of being unsafe into their world. Even when they become adults, they still feel unsafe. And that's why sometimes you feel you, you have to, um, um, adults who, are, who still um, have anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety, they are not able to relax, they become depressed because that internal model of being unsafe as a child has been carried into their adulthood. The other thing I wanted to say is that it's very interesting that um, the damages that are done to children in their early years do persist. We know that 50% um, well, of, of adults who have mental illnesses actually had those symptoms from the age of 14, and that 75% um, of adults who present with mental health problems, actually, when you look back, you find out that by their 20s, they had, had the symptoms. So really, um, these are things that we should take really very seriously. What are the other things we can do to support um, children who witness domestic violence or domestic abuse? It's important to talk to them about their fears. Children who witness domestic violence have a lot going on in their heads. One of the things that is going on in their heads is that they feel like they are to blame for their mother or their father being abused. They feel responsible that they are not able to defend their parents from the other parents. And you can imagine a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old who is, who is going around carrying that weight, that guilt, that, that they're actually responsible for what's going on to their parent, in, in, in their family home. Um, the other thing is that they do need reassurance. And um, that's why it's important for uncles, for aunties, for neighbors, everyone to be, to be out there to, um, to look out for them. And it could, in fact, actually be the, the, the victim in this case, because sometimes the, the women who are the victims in the case or the men who are the victims in the case are the ones that actually need um, to be able to speak to their children about what's happening. The other thing we need to do for them in, in, in interventions is to actually help them to understand boundaries. Let's help them to understand that it is not okay to hit somebody. It's not okay to lash out. It's not okay to touch somebody um, uh, in the, on their body without their consent. Because um, like Dr. Francis had earlier said, we know that uh, uh, when a, a young boy sees his father abuse his mother or his mother abuse his father, he's 10 times more likely than somebody who didn't witness that to have a violent relationship himself in future is 10 times more likely to be an abuser, to perpetrate abuse when he also gets into intimate relationships. For a, a young lady who has seen a mother being abused by a dad, she, um, or, or who has seen a mother being abused by a partner, she's six times more likely than the average person, an average young person to um, get into a sexually violent relationship. So really, uh, those are things that when children witness those things, we need to be able to try to, it's like we are reprogramming their minds. It's like we are telling them that, look, what you are witnessing at home is not the right thing. This is no, not the way things should be done. And finally, we need to help them to get help. How do we help them to get help? In terms of, uh, it could be help through the school counselor. The first place, usually I say that the first place to go to is usually to go to the GP. Because the GP, um, in terms of getting help for children who have witnessed domestic violence, the GP will usually be um, the place of the, the person who is able to signpost them to the right places. Sometimes a, an, um, a referral to children and, and adolescent mental services will be required because that child is so damaged by what they've seen. Maybe because they've become, maybe they, because they've developed post-traumatic stress or maybe because they become anxious or they become depressed. The other place, place to get mm -hmm. help would be the police. Um, if you feel that life is in danger, um, it's important to call 999 and, and, and get the police involved. Health visitors, midwives, the school. Uh, there's also the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. Uh, I'm going to share some of those, um, some of those pieces, pieces of information um, through, through Climax. The National Domestic Abuse Helpline is 0808-2247. It's a 24 hour helpline. Um, that people can consult 24 hours, um, 24, 24 hours of the day um, to get help regarding domestic abuse. There's a child line 0800 um, 
and that's actually a line for children. So children who feel that they are, um, they are victims of abuse or who are witnessing um, domestic abuse can actually call that line. So for if there's a, somebody who is, who, is with, who is on the call tonight, who, for instance, you, uh, you are a victim of that situation, maybe your partner um, is abusing your work or the other, that's a good number to give to the children. Um, there's also the yes, NSPC. War. <laughs> All right, okay. So there's also the NSPCC um, helpline, and there's the respect. Respect um, is actually um, a line, a, a phone, um, a phone line for people who are perpetrators. I think the point that Reverend Lade raised is a very important one about the fact that perpetrators need to be, they need to be supported to actually get help. And the perpetrator helpline is 0808 to 802 4040. We'll put all of those details online. Yes, yeah, yeah. so um, all of those uh, details I'm going to um, share. Um, Thank um, you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. If we're in a hall right now, however, we're in a virtual hall, I will say a round of applause for Dr. Ajayi. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. If you captured everything, it's like a topping on a very beautiful cake already. Um, Dr. Bomo gave um, fantastic um, backgrounds, uh, defining what domestic abuse is, and also domestic violence, and the different types of domestic abuse and violence that we have. And here you have Dr. Ajayi just kind of rounded everything all off, um, talking about um, the signs to look out for, the clinginess in children, and also the impact on young adults. I like the fact that we didn't just say children, it's also young adults. Sometimes the 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, we often overlook them, mainly because of the classification of ages. So as soon as a person is 18, we see them as, oh, yes, they're okay. But they're still children when you look at it, especially where they've grown up in an environment that has been dysfunctional. So oftentimes one of the key things that I say to people is when they say, oh, a single parent home is a dysfunctional home. And I say to them, no. There are lots of homes where you have the father and the mother there and it's absolutely dysfunctional. So that is not how you look at the functionality of a home. And that is why it's really important. I like the fact that um, Dr. Bumo and also Dr. Jai both talked about the religious aspect. It's the fact that those who are from the ethnic minority community, we have a rather sacrosanct, which is right, absolutely right. We have a sacrosanct approach towards family. We believe we'll hold on, you hold on to your marriage, you hold on because of the children, that is right. Absolutely right, there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, this is driven by our religious beliefs. It's a fact that a lot of us hold faith and our faith upholds the tenets of marriage, which is fantastic. Marriage is a beautiful place, entity, institution to be in. But where there is abuse, but I'd venture there's somebody watching us on Facebook or somebody who's in-house with us in the studio this evening, where there is abuse, it is not just about your life. So don't think it's just you, I can't take it. It's about the children. The secondary and the thirdary, if I can use that word, you can laugh, it's okay for you to laugh. Sometimes I make jokes. The secondary, the ripple effect on your family, your children, their friends, your siblings, your friends, it is usually immense. People go through trauma and they don't know it is trauma. And that is why the topic this evening is really, really important. Witnessing abuse alone sticks onto people's head for a long time. Witnessing your father beat your mother or your mother beat your father is a really horrible thing to be etched in the person's mind. And that is why it is important that if you're out there and you're a victim, please speak out. And if you're out there, I'm actually absolutely passionate about perpetrators. Passionate not from the negative point of view. Yes, there's a lot of finger pointing at perpetrators. Why would a man raise up his hand to beat his wife or his girlfriend? Why would a girlfriend, for example, raise up her hand to slap the boyfriend? Why would a woman beat the husband? Why would a woman stab the husband sexually, saying to him, well, I won't have sex with you. So if you don't, if you don't, if I don't give you, you know, it's you're punishing the man, that is an abuse. We need to balance it out here. 
Um, the reason why I'm talking about perpetrators is because oftentimes, most perpetrators have been victims themselves as well. They have either been victims when they were young, either a victim of sexual abuse, physical abuse by their parents. So what they want to do is to perpetrate it. If there's anything we should be doing in our community, it's not the ostracizing of the perpetrators. We don't want that. Because when you ostracize them, do you know what happens? I actually took um, a course on perpetrator management. And the only analogy that I could use to capture a perpetrator, if you usually notice, perpetrators often get drawn to women who are vulnerable. The picture I have in my brain is about how, um, how a shark, when it smells blood, it gets drawn to it. And that is how perpetrators are. Perpetrators from a mile off will smell a vulnerable woman. And that is why we have a lot of work to do in our community. I'm gonna bring on now a social worker who, you know what, I love to hear that a person is an independent advocate. I love it because I'm a mental health advocate. I challenge psychiatrists, I go to CPAs, I go to tribunals because I believe sometimes, you know, with all due respect to the clinicians in the house, I bow my, you know, with all due respect, Sometimes I think that um, some of the regimes are a bit draconian, you know? So it's good to be able to get somebody who can speak on their behalf. And we have Peace Ngozi Raji. She's a social worker and also an approved mental health practitioner that's called an AMP. And she's also a practice educator, fantastic. She has experience working in the area of mental health as a consultant, social worker, and as a senior practitioner. She's a founder of Mind Matters, an organization that is passionate about awareness and supporting Africans and baby communities, particularly in the area of mental health and promoting people's right to independence, choice and social inclusion. Join me and put your hands together if you can, if you're in the house, it's okay, let's make this lively. I know with all of these social distancing things, it's not like, but please put your hands together for, Ungo, for peace, Ungozi Raji. Over to you, you have 10 minutes or 15 minutes. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very, very much. That's a really wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Bomo and Dr. Ajayi. That was very, very insightful. Um, and yes, like Reverend Ladi has said, this is a very important topic that we are discussing. Um, very close to my heart. Sorry, my apologies. My apologies just for those who are on air, those who are on Facebook who like questions, they're going to be going into question and answers after um, after um, he speaks now. So please type your questions in the chat box. We're gonna be taking the questions. And if you're online as well, if you're watching up on Facebook, please type your question out there. We'll take them up later. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No problem at all. So like I said, very, very close to my heart. I have been a social worker for many years now, um, working specifically in the mental health field for a long time. And, you know, um, as a frontline staff, there's so many issues that get to us. And when you go back on the history, you realize, you know, the things that have come up from people's backgrounds, people's families. So I have to say that Dr. Ajay and Dr. Bobo, they've set, they've set me up really nicely, I have to say, giving all the background information, um, explaining all about what domestic violence is. And they're both psychiatrists, so they really understand how it affects mental health. So I'll be talking really from a very social work point of view. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation just to help things along and I'll try and share my screen if I can. Um, can we all see that? Yeah, excellent. All right, so um, yeah, it's, I'm looking at really how it affects children, safeguarding and mental health and what support we can get in the community. I also have to say, um, following what Reverend Ladi said, I have worked for South End for a long time, for many, many years. Um, so this, I'll be talking really based on South End um, and how it affects the people who live in South End, African communities in South End, and just generally people who live in South End. I'm aware there are lots of people who, who don't live in the UK, who don't live in the South End, and I, I know that, and I'm hoping that you will get something out of this. 
Um, so it's not just based for South End, just that lots of the resources I'll have, lots of the um, signposting will be for South End. There's some national resources to that, as Dr. Jayi says, he has, and we have that we will, you know, we will share with the Climax um, platform. All right, so this is just a recap. They've all talked about what domestic abuse is, anyone can be a victim, the effects on it, or the effects of domestic violence on victims. Um, we're really focusing on our African communities, our African families. So there are lots and lots of reasons why there's domestic violence, like Dr. Jaya said, Dr. Boma has said. But culturally, from what Ladi has, um, Reverend Ladi has said, you will see that there are other things that are specific to us as Africans, you know, cultural, gender roles, our in-laws, this thing about your witchcraft and enemies. Immigration is a really big problem. Um, many people haven't got their stays and therefore they are in vulnerable positions. There's the fear, the shame, the stigma, you know, family is so important, you can't tell, you know, what you're dealing in, in public sort of thing. And what all this does then really is people live in really stressful situations, live in difficult, challenging situations and don't seek help. And from a practitioner point of view in the front line, we then get referrals when things have escalated or things have gone out of hand. If you remember when Dr. Jai was talking, he said like, you know, early, early detention, early dete um, detection, early, if you seek help early, then really things can be put in place to support before things get out of hand. Many times people um, react because of all sorts of issues, financial, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol, issues that they have themselves and they, don't, they can't manage and therefore they lash out on others. People need information, support, advice. And if they can access this early, then we're sure that in many cases, things can be prevented. Many times cases come to the police or cases come to social services is because they've gone out of hand. They have been going on for a long time, but because no one you know, sought for help, no one raised up, said, oh, look, I'm going through this or my children are going through this or this is happening. And they just sit in these problems until things get out of hand. So what, what I'd like you to know really is where children are concerned, domestic violence is actually regarded as child abuse. So we've talked about trauma. The other the speaker speaking before me talked about trauma. Children seeing domestic abuse is regarded very much as child abuse as far as social services is concerned. Um, and that's because what we want for the children is for them to have good mental well-being, good social well-being. You know, we're looking out for the for children to grow up to be people who live in a world where you know, they have all the things they need. And repeated abuse in homes is actually child, um, ch child abuse. Also in homes where there's domestic violence, many, many times children witness physical abuse. So it's not just mom hitting dad, dad hitting mom, quarrels, arguments. It's not just that sometimes. Sometimes the children also feel the brunt because physically, they're, you know, they're smacked, they're hit, they're punched, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally, you know, and that is seen very much as child abuse. We, I think it was Kemi who said about, um, you know, when we first come into the UK, we come from totally different cultures, backgrounds, traditions, everything. So when, like, when a brand new place where we don't really understand what the laws are, we don't really understand what is expected of us. We come, and because we're maybe isolated, we're not mixing, we don't really know what's happening, we haven't got the information, then we end up doing things that we really shouldn't do. In England, because obviously this is where we are, we're speaking, I understand that there's a national, there's a, an international audience right now. But in England, there, there's like the Children's Act, there's, this, there's the Care Act, there's, you know, Safeguarding Vulnerable People Act, all sorts of, legislation strongly frowning on any kind of abuse on vulnerable people, on men and women, on children. And therefore, if 
people think that, like, you know, well, you're my child, I'm going to discipline you and I'm going to smack you so hard or hit you. You know, those things, those things have effects because those things are not allowed in this context. So we have to be mindful how we, you know, bring up our kids and how we are disciplining them and training them. There's so many ways to parent without resorting to assaulting children, essentially, because that's what it's seen as. Um, there's so many ways. And if, like I said before, many people have no idea of how they need to go about this or, or who to ask information or where to get the information from. And that's why we're holding this today so that people will have the information, they'll have the right places to ask the questions. A big problem you also have as people from African backgrounds is like, we don't think, and it's right that the people we're dealing with, people, professional people will understand where we're coming from. They'll understand our culture. They'll understand what we're going through. And that's right, because sometimes they really don't. Um, but get, that's why this is so important. Um, we hope that after this workshop, especially people who live here in the UK, who live in the local area where we are at South End and Essex and Thorock, will be able to know that they can get the information and advice they need from Climax, from Mind Matters, and all the other people, um, all the other services that we will you know, be di directing them to. So it's important to know, like I've said, um, domestic violence is very well, is very linked to child abuse. And in fact, it is child abuse. And when um, children see this repeatedly, it has a lot of implication for them. Um, yeah. And also to remember about where we're coming from, we're in, a we're in a whole new world, if you like, a whole new society that has rules and regulations that we need to abide by so that, you know, we, we can apply the best of our culture, but also, you know, imbibe the best of, the, of their culture, if that makes sense, in bringing up our children and, and living healthy family lives. So if there's anything to take away from today, from this workshop, anything to take away from today, to identify if you are in an abusive relationship, or if there's anyone you know who has some of these signs and symptoms that you know, some of our clinicians have, our clinicians have talked about today. Um, they've talked about you know, like how people might present, you know, wearing clothes, jackets in summer or, or how children present in school or that, you know, things like that. When you, when you say that that triggers, you know, it triggers you to think, right, is this person going through a difficult time? You have to remember like for the children, for example, in the schools they attend, all their teachers are looking out to make sure that the children are coming from homes where there are no issues. If, you know, social services will get referrals all the time about from schools, from daycares, from crutches about alarming signs or sign, concerning signs that children display. So all those things um, are things for you to look out for. And I know we, we've talked really about religious um, organizations and places of worship. It's also something that for us to, to be aware of when we see families and children behaving in strange ways, in concerning ways, those are things that like raise your alarm bells. If you are at immediate risk, you really need to ring the police. Like Dr. Francis said, an abuser will always abuse. So we, sorry? An abuser will always abuse. So it's to, to make sure you ring the police. Speak up. Speak up. It's very important. Um, don't wait till you're hurt, till something is broken, till someone is dead, you know, till people end up with mental health services or, or end up with social services for their children. Speak up at the early stages and try and seek help and support. What we would like you to take out of here today also is where to get domestic abuse support. There are lots of, lots of supporting organizations across England, their national ones. And I know even if you're not in England, I mean, this is why you have Climax, you've got Mind Matters. We're here to give support, give information, give advice. 
after this um, program, we'll be running mentorship programs for people who need to speak to us confidentially, who need information, who need advice, who need referring signposting. Climax will be here to support you going further. So it's not just a one-off um, workshop where we just talk loads. There's also the work to do afterwards to support people going forward. Right, so like I've said, these are some of the supports for, you know, they're targeted at our African communities, like Climax, Mind Matters, Africa, Sister Space. These are some ethnic or African focused support organizations that can help, um, you know. And for those of us who live in South End, I don't know if that's very clear, but for those of us who live in South End, these are some other places that can support you. So you've got Compass, you've got Safer Spaces, they are free phones for domestic abuse numbers. You know, there's SOS Domestic Abuse Projects. There's so many, so many support groups. I mean, if you need the information, we will be able to provide this for you. Also nationally, because I've just, if for just for space and for time, there's lots of national support groups as well, which we'll, we'll make available after this program. And then we talked about mental health because- You have yeah. one minute to round up now. We have you. one minute to round up, one minute so to we'll round talk up. About, <laughs> we'll talk about mental health and you know how domestic abuse also affects your mental health. So if you feel worried about your mental health, you need to consult your GP. You can attend A&E and, &E and there's always a mental health worker in A&E. &E. Um, I know that many times that's what we, we, we want to pray about it. We're worried about the stigma. It needn't be so. People, mental health is an illness like any other, any other illness. Fiscal, mental, they're the same. There's no need to have any stigma attached to it. You seek early support and chances are that the prognosis will be, will be um, positive. You can speak to your family member, somebody you trust. who has got the Samaritans. Also, um, if you need support with your mental health, like Dr. Jayi said, if you see your GP, they can refer you to all sorts of services. I mean, the services, you know, like therapy for you in South End is, is a free service. Um, there's the recovery college. There's Thank you very much. We're going to put all of this information up, um, up on Facebook. And also, um, if we can have them on the chat box, that would be very helpful. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank right. you so, very, very much, please. Right. So that's it um, from me. But um, thank you very much. And I just hope you got something positive out of that. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. We did. We did. Thank you. If you just stop sharing your screen right now. Thank you. Um, and we do not. We, let's take the highlight off from me now. And we, we are going into our question and ask, answer session. Question and answers. So can you take the spotlight off from me so that we can see everybody? Okay, brilliant. Fantastic. Can we just give a round of applause to our three presenters, please? Dr. Francis, thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. You laid a fantastic background on which um, Dr. Ayodele wrote on. Um, he was able to expose, give a, a, a lot more details on um, the effect of um, domestic abuse on children. And of course, Peace has done a fantastic job as well. Obviously, she is a social worker and approved mental health practitioner. So she's given all of those, you know, good coverage, kind of like a, a nice topping on a good cake. Um, sorry, I, need, I, I, forgot to put, <laughs> I forgot to put my video on. <laughs> I don't know what happened. My video was taken off. Okay, it'll be okay for us to unmute ourselves now because I think it's kind of okay. This is like, you know, what I like to call an open mic session. So we've heard the fantastic delivery from our three earlier speakers. I'm going to be talking about later. I think I've kind of woven my speech into the whole talk, which is around perpetrator management. I've done that already. I don't want to take too much time, although I have a little bit after the question and answer that I'll be talking about. And that is on the type of support the community can give. So we've had the clinical side, we've had the social work side. What about the community? We'll talk about that later. So it's an open house now. There's a few questions that I know have been put on the um, chat box and I'll start with that. 
Uh, we could put our hands up. If you want to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand up. Um, and I will call so that we're not all speaking at the same time, just to kind of give some good coordination in the house. So um, somebody asked here, bear with me one moment. Somebody asked here if there is a, if Climax is able to help in Nigeria. That's the first question I can see on the chat box. And if anybody is on Facebook, if there's any question that has been typed on Facebook, please let me know as well. Um, the question is, is Climax able to help in Nigeria? And I'll leave that to the convener of the platform today to answer. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that question. And thank you to everyone who has spoken. Well done. We'll be coming back to that, but I'm going straight to the question. Uh, Basic, uh, for now, we are able to support you remotely by posting you to uh, counseling units in Nigeria for whom we partner with. Unfortunately, there's not many counseling centers in Nigeria, and this is something that we're trying to advocate for, that we get things done. However, we do run like uh, some kind of mushroom counseling once in a while in Nigeria, but there's a way we can get you supported remotely. And you can always contact us via info at climax.org.uk or you call the number 078-974-74114. Of course, that would be plus 44078, uh, plus 4478-974-74114. Or just send your email through and we should be able to get you the needed help. The most important thing is wherever you are in any part of the world, seek help, either through Climax Family Hub or look for a local uh, counseling unit or support unit, uh, a doctor or someone who is into social work who can help you get the right and needed help. We can't overemphasize that because a lot of people are dying every day and it needed be. So please, it doesn't matter whether you come through us uh, home or abroad, the most important thing is seek help at the earliest sign. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Kimmy. Fantastic answer. It's the fact that wherever you are, whether you have um, agencies there or not, it's about talking out. Um, even in Nigeria, I'm very much aware that we have the Mirabel Center. There are loads of NGOs on ground in Lagos, in Abuja, Port Harcourt, all the main cities. I do know that because Nigeria is a large country, they may not be able to cover every single state there, but most all the states, almost all the states, I'm not sure about the northern states, don't let me say all, they actually have hubs, they have domestic abuse support. Most of the first ladies in the various states actually have started organizations to help women who may be going through domestic abuse. Okay, thank you very much for that. There's a question that has been put up here. Um, and this is a question that I was saying privately to Dr. Ajayi. And he, the question is, uh, should African churches not do more to elevate this problem? Mm. To elevate the problem or to de-escalate the problem? Okay, um, rather than in most cases, aiding and abetting. That's a really big question. I wonder if I, I know I'm a woman of the garment. You know, people say men of garment. <laughs> so I'm able to speak on behalf of um, African churches because I worship in an African church and I'm, I'm a minister of the gospel as well. And uh, this is something that is very, very close to my heart. But if there's any other man or woman of the garment that's in the house that may want to answer that, or perhaps maybe Dr. Ajayi, just a quick quote, then I will top it up. I have my angle to that. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, I think that it's a very relevant point. Absolutely. I think that, uh, and I feel that the place to start is really to education. I think that ministers of the gospel uh, need to be educated in terms of actually safeguarding issues. Um, I think that uh, we need to have a culture in which Generally, we have all our workers, all our volunteers, particularly people who are working with children, having to go through basic safeguarding um, training so that they can know what the warning signs are and they know what to do in order to raise um, um, safeguarding a lot. I think that's a very important thing. I also do think that we need to revisit our doctrines. Um, I, I'm a minister of the gospel as well. 
And I think we need to revisit, revisit our doctrines when it comes to um, really being dogmatic about women staying in an abusive relationship. I think mm. that that's something as well that is that is sometimes detriment, detrimental. People say, oh, um, um, they are staying there for their children. But we do know that, in fact, statistics shows that those, those who stay in a violent marriage or in a bad marriage, their children are worse off mentally and, and emotionally than people who are raised by a single parent where the family is stable. So I think those are things to, to think about. Um, certainly, um, I think education will be a very crucial one for ministers of the gospel, and not just for ministers, but for people in the rank and file of church, so that really we are not just we are not being dogmatic about our interpretation of scriptures, but we are able to give support to people who are in need of the support. But I think it's a relevant point. Thank you very much. I, I, I totally agree with you in everything that you said. It's a very relevant point. It's about awareness. It's about education. And it is also about creating a culture, an environment where people can speak up. Yeah. Because one of the key things that I know as well that um, is very, very, which is okay, is the fact that um, there is a, it's theocracy, it's called. So in churches, you know, there's um, a belief that the pastor has a final say. It is what the pastor say. You cannot question the pastor. It is what he's received from God. And we know that one clear thing that God is against is abuse. God is a God of justice. It's a God who defends the fatherless, who defends the voiceless. It's a God who will stand up very, very strongly to protect people. So uh, our doctrines need to be revisited. Um, can I even say doctrines per se? Well, okay, our doctrines need to be revisited around that word, that scripture that people quote. And I'm going to quote it now because I'm a person, I'm a Christian. I'm sure they probably have something similar within the Muslim faith, because I do understand that it's a mixed audience that we have this evening. So for the Christian people, they will say, oh, God hates divorce. God said he hates divorce. But do you know that in that same scripture that people quote, God talks about how he fights for the women who have been badly treated. God hates, God hates divorce. At the same time, God hates abuse. And God does not want anybody to be abused. So nobody should hide under the guise of Christianity or religion to perpetuate abuse. And one thing I must say as well that I understand and I have, I have come across is that sometimes, and I think um, Dr. Francis talked about this, sometimes the religious leaders are the perpetrators of the abuse themselves. Yes. They are perpetrators of the abuse themselves. So um, that is where awareness comes in. There is a little bit that I was going to talk about, but since we're already asking, there's no point in me giving a different speech. It's about coercive control. So last year, 2019, coercive control was actually included as past part of the definition for domestic abuse. Yeah. So yes, you have not beaten the woman, you have not stabbed, you have not slapped her, you have not withdrawn money from her, you have not stabbed, you know, you've not done all the common forms of abuse that we know, but you control her. You control him. You ask, who is calling you? What did you, you went out for 15 minutes. That journey you should do within 10 minutes. How come you spent five minutes extra? You are monitoring how many friends she has. These are, mm -hmm. these are forms of abuse that we don't normally talk about, but yes. it is abuse. The law recognizes it now as a form of abuse. It's coercive control. What did you eat? Why are you wearing a red dress? I asked you to wear a brown dress. Mm. I am your boyfriend. I am your husband. I am your wife. I am your girlfriend. You should do what I said you should do. All those are forms of coercive uh, control that we need to be aware of as well. Because um, there are deeper issues that people have. It is a fact that that reigns in the head, in the mind of that woman or that man and it affects them. So um, yes, we should be talking about it more. And I think it has gradually started, to be honest with you. Um, I know that in the last two, three years, I have been at various religious platforms where we've talked about domestic abuse, and of course, mental health as well. These are the two topics that are not often talked about in the church, domestic abuse 
and mental health, and of course, divorce. But gradually, we're getting there. It's a fact that we're talking about it today, and then we continue talking about it. We cannot keep quiet. We, the more the voices, the louder we are. The more we talk about the signs to look out for, and that's why I agree totally with what Dr. Ajayi just said now, is the fact that we need to understand what are the signs. When the woman is telling you, when her husband comes in, ah, don't come in, don't, eh, come in later, come in later, come in later. I don't want my husband to hear. Those are little signs. So you hear those kind of signs from a friend straight away, you're like, mm, that's a pointer. That's somewhere going somewhere. I mean, that's something going somewhere. Somebody is telling you, oh, I cannot eat that kind of food because my husband doesn't want me to eat it. Of course, there's nothing wrong if you agree with your husband. But however, there is a limit and there's a cutoff mark. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic question. The next question somebody is asked here is, what can a mom do for her little children? They are six and three, going through emotional trauma for the loss of their, of their father. How can a young widow get to the death of her husband? I know this is not exactly related to domestic abuse, but I'd like to direct this question to Dr. Francis, who had mentioned a little bit about trauma earlier. So I repeat the question again, Dr. Francis. This person is asking how a young mom can support the child, uh, the children, six and three, that are going through emotional trauma due to the death of their father. Thank you very much for that. And I think um, the first port, port, port of call should be her GP if she's in this country. There's so many um, services for young children who have suffered bereavement. I know there are lots of counseling services for them. And if she contacts her GP, depending on where she lives, her GP will be able to signpost her there. Okay, are there some, are there some, um... Are there some practical tips that you can give? Yes, I can go to the GP, but some practical tips. I know when Dr. Ajayi spoke, he spoke a little bit. The first thing is to, to, to make sure. Mm -hmm. Go to, ahead. To talk about it. To yeah. talk about it. To, to let them talk of the good memories they've had with their dad. Talk about it, that it's not their fault. Because sometimes the children might feel, oh, I was naughty. That's why my dad passed away or something. And it also depends. Was it sudden? Was it um, a sudden death? Was it expected? I know sometimes when death is impending or expected, um, if it's cancer or something, the hospice usually offers counseling to the children and to the family members. So it's good to talk about it and to emphasize on the positive aspects and make sure they believe or tell them that it's not their fault. Maybe their dad was ill or something happened, that it's not their fault. The first thing is to make them not blame themselves, to take the blame away from themselves. The important thing is to talk about it. Like is it BT says, it's good to talk. You need to talk, don't bottle anything up. Thank you. Fantastic, it's good to talk yeah. about it. And I, yeah. I, I agree totally, it's good to talk. But however, it's important that they talk in, a, in an atmosphere that is safe, because that is important as well. It is one caveat that I always sound each time People say, yes, we talk, yes, we so talk. Don't just talk to anybody. But the platform, the talk person, to, yeah. the environment you talk is really important. Yeah. The persons you're talking to is really important and how you talk is really important. So That's yes, for them as a family, it's good for them to talk together. But it's also good to reach out as well to people who you know are trained to be able to listen to you. And I That's agree why. with you totally, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go That's ahead, why the GP will be the, a good part of call because they will know the local counseling services um, for the for them to direct signpost the children to. Also, if it was cancer or something else, the hospice also has regular counseling for children too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also have people in the community uh, who can. Uh, uh, I who, think. I think. Sorry to cut in. I think the most important thing is for the mother or the father who has lost his father to first and foremost seek help themselves because until you are able to help yourself uh it may be difficult to support the children because sometimes it's not about what we say it's what the children sees as well telling a child not to cry about it or not to feel bad about it when you're still crying or mourning may not be as productive as them seeing you living and supporting them as you ought to. So the first and foremost thing is for you to step out and don't just 
uh, assume that that is the end of the world for you. It's a difficult thing. It's something we never pray to happen to any one of us. But hey, life happens. And when it happens, there are people out there, like uh, the experts have said, speak to your GP. But I know within and around wherever you are, there are support groups that you can join as well. Also is the idea of, you know, we are Africans. Even if you cannot reach out to professionals, there are aged people around you. Don't let us forget our parents, they are still the source of our strength. You know, our relative, our what have you, people you know that you can trust, not just anybody within your network, people you know you can actually pour your tears on their shoulder and they will give you that comfort. And the most important thing that is, pick up yourself together to be able to support your children. That is a difficult thing to say. However, that is the reality because it is in you getting recovery very quickly that your children also will get supported. I, th I think the question was what to do with her children. It's with the children, yes. It's with the children, it's not specific her. With the if children, it's with the adults, her. then there's yes. so many there's so many things for adults. What I'm saying, what I'm saying here is that we a need self to support service, the children. And it's everywhere. We need to support the children. But most importantly is, I'm speaking to her because I want to believe that sometimes as hard as we okay. want to assume that we are strong. Okay. Where we're not. So in supporting the children, she herself may need to get the support mm. in order to support those children more effectively. Okay, for, for, for the children, I would have um, some more practical tips I would suggest. Um, we've talked about talking within the family. I think it's good for the family to come together closer around that time. It's creating time during the day, during weekends, you do things together. Don't avoid mentioning the name of your dad or their dad. Don't avoid mentioning his name. Talk about him fondly. Um, if there if there were unresolved issues, which possibly could have happened, unresolved issues, don't run away from talking about it. Talk among yourselves as a family unit first. You need to um, you need to bond with them. Go the extra mile. If they want to cry, allow them to cry. And it's okay for them to see you weak as well. It's okay for them to see you vulnerable. We often run away with this concept that we have to be strong for our children, strong yeah. for our children. Do you know that vulnerability is a form of strength as well? Let them know that mommy too is struggling. Mommy is struggling. We're missing daddy. Mommy is struggling. Let's talk. What do you miss about daddy? Be very, very practical with them. Take them out. Go for walks together. Don't do the walk alone. Pray together if you're a family. Pray together. Read books together. Whatever faith you are, use your object of faith, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, whatever thing you have. Read it together. Those practical things really, really do help. Sing. Sing. One of the often ignored therapies that people think, you know, oh, it's too far off, is singing. Your, your voice might not be fantastic. Sing together as a family. Children connect to singing at that age. Three and six. Sing. Play music around the house. Make the house lively. Change the position of the house. You know, buy new things around the house. Do practical things that the children will look forward to. Change their room. Change the design of their room. Change their bed sheet. Change. Do practical things that will brighten their day. But never, ever ignore the emotions. That's really important. Ask them, how are they feeling? Do you dream about daddy? Do you dream about... Ask specific questions. Don't run away from talking about it. Because sometimes parents are so embroiled in their own emotions that they sometimes are not looking deep down, look deep down. And there were some key things that Dr. Ajayi said earlier. Yes, it was, he gave those pointers, those signs, those, those symptoms are things to look out for, for a child who's in, a, in an environment of domestic abuse. It's the same signs that you get for a child who might be stressed or who may be going through trauma. It's the bed wetting, it's the becoming very clingy, it's the crying too much. When those things get very high, then seek help. Don't keep quiet about it. Speak with your GP. But if there's any time for you to bond together as a family, it is now. Don't leave a gap at all. It is now. And of course, we have people in our community. We have older ones. We still have our elders in our community who we can call on to, we can speak to. They are a major resource of support that we should never discount in us or push back. Our parents are there. Our aunties and our uncles are there. Use those resources. 
Okay, I'm just looking through to see more questions that may be reached. If anybody has any question in the house, please put your hand up, okay? Kemi has a question or an addition. Yeah, this is not actually my question. It's from Facebook audience. And Fantastic, okay. Uh, she said, she, said uh, she asked rather, how do you help a man who can't come out to express the fact that he's been abused because the, of the society's stigmatization? Okay, I think I don't. I don't know. I think is it, would it be okay for me to answer that question? Because I actually yes, have <laughs> I'm actually a champion, and it it sounds a little bit, you know. How can you be? Uh, how could you be championing the cause of perpetrators? And the fact that I also understand the balance that the the talk in the community is so much is very lopsided, absolutely lopsided around the fact that um, uh, women are the one that experience domestic abuse. Yes, the statistics are higher. I agree that. Well, however, because I've worked with some people in the community, I'm very much aware of men who have been abused by their partners, sexually abused, socially abused, financially abused, physically abused. What do you do? One of the things in which you need to let the person know is to normalize it. One way, when I talk, I'm also a mental, I'm a mental health first aider, I'm a mental health first aid instructor, I'm a mental health advocate. I run an organization called News, and I do a lot of work in the community around mental health, supporting peer support in the community. You normalize it to the man. Because, you know, men have an ego. Pardon me, we all have egos, but, you know, with all due respect to the men in the house, I bow my, I bow my heart to all of you. The egos of men are a little bit bigger than us women, you know. For them, it's a sign of weakness to cry. It's, you know, it's, it's the hormones in them. It's right. It's okay. When we normalize issues, people feel a lot more better. The stigma around those issues are drawn down a little bit. Normalize it. Let them know that, you know what? What you're going through is not unusual. That's the truth. It's just like sexual abuse. Sexual abuse, <laughs> I have counseled men who have been victims of sexual abuse when they were younger. You need to normalize it and let them know that what you've gone through or what you're going through is very, very much normal. You need to make them feel safe, that you're not judging them. Mm. Don't tell them that they're weak, that, oh, why didn't you deal with your wife? Why didn't you, oh, you should have dealt with her? Why did you allow her to talk to you like that? No, you need to hear. You need to practice what I call active listening. Mm. Active listening is important. One thing I say with us, a lot of Bain community, with all due respect, my apologies, we hear, we don't listen. We're all too quick to jump. We're all very quick to jump to the conclusion and to be advising. This is not the time for you to advise. This is the time for you to listen to them and signpost them. If you don't have the resource with you, if you don't know where to signpost them to immediately, tell them you come back to them. Have an open door. They may not want to talk to you immediately. Don't give up. They may want, they may not want to acknowledge that they are in an abusive relationship. Don't give up. In a very, very silent, persistent way, go back to them and open the conversation again. Let them see the benefit of opening up and seeking help on time. I don't know if any of the panelists have anything else to add to that. Yeah? Okay. Any other question? Okay, Kemi, you want to say Yeah, something? just just a, a quick add to that. Uh, you know, in marriage, men and women, uh, uh, whatever a man can get, a woman can get. And it's a big thing in our community, especially the African community that we belong to, that we use sex as a weapon. And so it's financial, you know, uh, side of things. In this part of the world, most women get tends to, you know, get in ahead of things quite early, and so men are always uh, are often at a disadvantage. I uh, was having a chat with Peace earlier during the week, and we are talking about a lot of men being in the mental home. Uh, we, we comparison with uh, all this uh, that uh, women using the children to actually. Uh, abuse them, you know, after maybe following suppression or something like that. Yeah. So what I just want to drive at is, it's not just within the marriage itself alone. After marriage, even after divorce, people can still abuse you. A man can still abuse you. Somebody uh, trying to 
monitor your movement, shadowing you everywhere, still uh, trailing you all over social media. All these things are not normal. And as a man, if you are experiencing such, it's not something to be ashamed about. The better, the, and the earlier and the better you speak about it, like Reverend Lade said, the uh, quicker you get the support. And it doesn't mean whether you speak to, you know, one, eight, two, three people, and they do not actually understand you. The most important thing is that you are talking about it because that is a therapy on its own. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And hang on, life happens. If it's happening to you, it doesn't mean that you have done something wrong because that is another thing for men. They often assume that they are a failure. No, you're not. It just happens that things does not add up in certain area and you're not the only one who is experiencing whatever you are experiencing. So don't feel like you, you're lost. You're not yeah. alone. Speak up and seek, uh, seek help Absolutely. when they did. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Dr. Ajay has put a question, has put some additional resources here just in case there's a man out there who has experienced abuse, but this is specifically for sexual abuse. It's, a five, it's called a 5 billion men national helpline for men who have experienced sexual abuse. For those who are on Facebook who cannot read the chat, I'm going to read the number out. It's um, 0808-800-5005. The number again is 0808-800-5005. That's an important number for people to call. Men also suffer abuse. So please don't keep quiet. And I will say again, being vulnerable is strength. For me, when you're vulnerable and you cover your vulnerability, it's actually weakness. Your strength is projected when you're able to talk and you seek help for it because of the fact that you're getting up from lying down and accepting everything, which is really, really important. Somebody else also added this tip, which I think is really good. This is for the mother who has... Um, who is taking care of the three-year-old and the six-year-old young children that have lost their father. Um, this person suggested, keep busy. You could start a memorial fund raising in his memory, which is fantastic, which is a good one. So keep busy, do something in his memory. Don't, don't brush his memory aside and say, I don't want to hear his name, dash that. No, don't bury your head in the sand. You seek for help, like Kemi said earlier, but at the same time, get help for the children as well. At the same time, together as a family, come together, keep busy. You could start a memorial fund in his memory. That's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have any questions in the house? We, okay. We, can, we, can have, we, a, we have another want... question from Another Facebook. question. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the question reads, is it okay to not intervene when a person is in serious danger of domestic abuse because they are uh, they always go back to the abusive spouse and they join and to fight you. That means, is it okay not to say anything or, you know, to ask someone to leave? Or I'm just interpreting the question, but the okay. bottom line is, is it okay to step aside from helping? I would ask Peace to answer that question, Peace. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually going to answer the question. So. Oh, no, I know who to direct the question to, don't worry. <laughs> I don't think it's okay never to intervene. Obviously, there is only so much you can do. So what, you, first of all, you make it clear that you can see that they had a problem um, or that there's something concerning going on, that's one. You give all the information and advice that you can, um, you know, and just be there as a silent support. Sometimes people are not really ready. The, the problem with abuse many times is that People who stay in abusive relationships, there is, I'm going to use the word gain. There's something they think they're gaining. You know, they want to be married. They, they have financial security. Their children are there. They don't know how to leave the place because of all sorts of reasons, you know, like um, I, I can't be divorced because it's a shame or maybe he will change. So sometimes people are not really ready to take the step. So what you can do as their friend, as, this, as, as their family is, just say to them, I know something is going wrong. Don't be uh, negative. Don't be, you know, don't nag. Don't keep going on about, oh, this is wrong or you're wrong. Just be there as a silent support. Be a listening ear because at some point, 
when they're ready to make the move, then they'll be able to speak to you once they know you're there in the background supporting. Like I say, if you have all the information you've given it to them, they will start it hopefully somewhere in the back of their mind so that when they need to take that move, they will know where to go to and where to start from. So it's, I mean, it's a really difficult thing to leave a relationship that you've had for a long time. It's really difficult, even, even in the most dire circumstances when people are, I don't know, hitting you. And I'm telling you as social workers, we see it all the time, you get all sorts of safeguarding referrals over and over again about the same person. And you think, why wouldn't they just leave? And sometimes they go to the police, then they say, oh, we're not doing, we're not, we want the police to be joined. You know, they do that all the time. Like that's also because it's, it's a really difficult decision to take. There, you know? there is a clinical side to it I would like Dr. Boom, um, Dr. Francis to talk about, and that is a syndrome called the battered women syndrome. It is actually a psychiatric condition, and I'd like you to talk about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The, I like you see, um, I did the cycle of um, abuse. Most of the time, the women don't want to leave because it's almost like a learned helplessness. Mm. The first thing is that the stigma the, in in our society, there's a lot of stigma to divorce and single parenting. They they learned helplessness. They're just used to it. They say, oh. You, what uh, he'll just beat me today tomorrow he will beg me he'll buy me this um so they, they, they're just they've, they they're just there they don't want to move again it might be they have a mental underlying mental health issue maybe they're depressed or or they have a low self esteem because the man will so put them down that who will look at who will look at you with four children, where are you going to? Which man will look at you? So all that will be in the back of the woman's mind. She has been abused so many times that no one will look at you. Look at you, you're so fat, you're so ugly, you have too many children, which man will want you? They will only want to sleep with you. I'm the only one that can tolerate you. So the woman believes that in herself. So, on, and again, the church doesn't help. The church will say, you're not, oh, I'm sorry, not the church. The, Anyway, our, 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 our church leaders won't help and say, no, you have not prayed enough. You've done something. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to do this to, to continue your fault. So it's somehow like we continue to blame ourselves, blame the woman, and we find the woman finds it difficult to leave. So they are battered. We all know they are battered. Everyone is seen. Oh, why isn't Aiden? It's almost like a learned helplessness. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Is there, has there been any other question from Facebook? I'll just go into, into the room now. We're going to the studio. Does anybody, is anybody in the studio? Does anybody in the studio have a question? If you have a question, can you unmute your device or put your hand up and we'll give you a call? Anybody in the studio with a question? Okay, it looks like um, the panelists are presenting everything absolutely well. I have a question I'm going to ask later, but go ahead, Kemi. Uh, uh, the question that comes through is, how do you help an abuser who always plays the victim, pointing out accusing fingers always at his victim? Okay, that was, that's very close to the question I was going to ask. It was a question I'd answer, actually. And um, this is around gaslighting. Um, gaslighting is one of the forms and one of the ways in which perpetrators use to psychologically control. This is not even about the coercive control now. It's about the psychological control of the victims. Mm. And that's why I keep talking very much about the need for us to think about how we break that pattern that perpetrators have. Because perpetrators have a pattern. Um, most times when they break up the relationship or when the, the victim leaves, they go to another relationship and they do the same. I have dealt with perpetrators who have, in over six relationships, in two years, six relationships, exactly the same pattern. Pick this, the women up in the same way, trail them the same way. One of the things that perpetrators do is the gaslight. They make the victim to look like they are the abusers. They put words that they have not said into their head. How mm -hmm. can you stop that? It's a long thing that you have to be very careful how you manage that. 
I know that peace had mentioned um, when we talked about peace mentioned earlier about uh, um, you know in response to the question she answered that um, if a person if you observe a person being abused what do you do? One of the things I always say as well is that be careful how you approach it. Be very very careful how you approach the victim and also the perpetrator. The victim particularly because what happens is like it's like a hornet's nest. When you're approaching a business, you don't just go in. You have to plan, you have to strategize. Because the mere fact that you have asked the, abuse, the, the, the victim the question, and she's been psychologically controlled by the partner, she will tell the partner that, oh, this was what X said. So you have to plan mm -hmm. and you have to watch how you ask the question. It's got to be done in a very intelligent way. So going back to the question that was asked online, how do you help that person? It's a whole lot of work that we cannot answer now. It's about how you work with the victim of a narcissist, how you turn the table round. We can't, I can't, I don't know if the other panelists have some suggestions, but I know it's a whole raft of work about how that victim can work with them. Uh, it is often common. That pattern is very, very common in abusive relationships. It was your fault. It was because you cooked the dinner late. That's why I slapped you. It was your fault. It was because you didn't give me enough money. That's why I denied you of sex. It was your fault. So that is a normal pattern. It's about that person getting up, building up their self-esteem and recognize that this is an abuse because sometimes they don't recognize an abuse. Recognizing, accepting an abuse and planning the exit. Exit must always be planned. You can't just jump out. Because the psychological tie is usually very, very difficult. That's why you find most victims going back to their perpetrators because it was not well planned. Mm -hmm. You have to plan it. You have to support the person. They have to be in a state of mind where they're ready to leave and they're closing the door and they're leaving. Oftentimes, even after the planning, they still go back to the abuser. And that's why it's something that you need to plan very well. That's why you have independent domestic violence advocates they don't just jump in, they work very strategically with the victims. They will tell the victim to plan, to pack out immediately. No, they plan it. It's a phase step-by-step -step thing that they do. So I will say to that person, get in contact with an IDVA. Get in contact with domestic abuse services who will work with you. To plan either how you stand strong to stop the abuser so that the abuser can get help. That is where the perpetrator management comes in or you plan your exit to leave. Um, uh, also, I just want to add to that, that planning, in planning your exit, you have to understand that most times when things happen in our community, we are often uh, very quick to run to uh, religion leaders, uh, parents, and what have you. And uh, uh, I don't mean this in any bad way, but it's, it's the evidence that we do get suggests that these people are not uh, trained and they don't have the capacity to often provide the needed advice and support at that junction. Most times they encourage the victim to stay there. And in, in so, so sorry, say, can, can you, sorry, I just need to interject here. I must say though that there's been a lot of changes in the last two, three, four years. I don't want us to bash our religious leaders no, because I, a I'm lot of bashing. them are speaking up. No, a lot of religious leaders are speaking up now. A lot of them are protecting. They may not be telling you to divorce, but they will be telling you to move out and your safety. Because okay. I've been on several platforms where they are actually advocating the safety of victims. So I think we should just balance it a little bit. Okay, that's a good that's a good development and something that is well overwhelmed, especially at this time. And I I'm, I hope that a lot of people will be able to do that. Even me saying it does not mean that it's applicable to all religion leaders. What I'm just trying to drive at is the fact that uh, seeking the right form of support is quite key, you know, because sometimes if you go to a meat seller to provide you advice on pepper. They may not have every of the needed, yeah. uh, 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 the needed skill Absolutely. to give you the right support at Absolutely. that point. Yeah. So, in our cultural understanding of marriage, and I'll give you an example. Some like the, there's some religion that believe in a man marrying 
more than one wife, seven wives, and what have you. And what did you often see is neglect. <laughs> the thing is going to die again. And young Can we people, please mute our devices, please? Can you please mute your device if you're not speaking, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Kemi. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was giving an example of whereby, you know, it is culturally accepted that some men can have up to three, four, five wives. And if with my understanding, there are still men in this country who just practice that. And what you often get is women being neglected and the children who are suffering, but because of the cultural beliefs and what uh, we've been taught to do, that you just have to stay and weather the storm. What we are saying is, weigh out all your options and try to seek the right form of help that will help your situation. Yes, living immediately may not be the answer, but when you get the right form of support and what have you, you will be able to support yourself and especially your children in moving on and creating a better and healthier atmosphere for yourself and your kids to grow, especially mentally. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely right. So we have another question here. But before I read that question, I just want to read some quick pointers to the reasons why people may not seek help. Um, to disclose domestic violence is one, the fact that they're not realizing that it's abuse is because sometimes they put the abuse at the back of their mind is one is a gender issue, cultural, fear of immigration status that happens a lot, especially those who got their status because of their spousal visa, for example. So the man would lie to them or the woman would lie to them. If you talk, they will not get your paper. So they keep quiet about it. Is isolation from friends, is fear, fear of disclosure would not be believed, is, you know, you know, most abusers, most perpetrators, they, they know how to put a fantastic look out there. So it's like, oh, ooh, tell, uh, your husband that loves you, the one that kisses you and touches you outside everywhere, it's a lie. You must be the one at fault. So they keep quiet because of that. It's a fact that when they're scared that when they disclose the abuse that there'll be further violence, it's a fear of social, social services. So I know that one key fear in our community, there's the social workers, they fear you. I must tell you that, peace. You are feared. So most people in the community don't want social services in their matter. But we're here to say that social services are there to support. Don't run away. Now I'll come back to that. Don't run away because they will be there to support you. Don't run away. It's blaming attitude. It's shame and embarrassment. It's psychological distress. It's professional failure. I mentioned earlier about the fact that 30%, so there are 100 cases, only 30 of those 100 cases are actually picked up by the police. Do you know that out of those 30, it's only 17% that actually gets prosecuted? So it is a failure. It is a failure of this criminal justice system with all due apologies. It's a fact that the woman will say, well, I reported the last time. I observed this person whose husband slapped her. The man is out there walking on the street. Services are being drastically caught. Even the police, they're being drastically caught. So the amount of hours they would have spent before in investigating and bringing perpetrators, taking them to the Crown, uh, to the Crown Prosecution Service is reduced. So all of those things can be a fair why a woman or a man may not want to speak out. But social services are out there to support. But the reason why I mentioned that peace, you don't, the reason why I mentioned that is because I know that in our community at the moment, and that is because of a lot of issues that have happened in our community where children have been taken away, most families keep quiet. That's the truth. I, okay, I, your one minute, your one minute. Yes, go ahead. go ahead. I completely agree with you that people are a bit worried about social services and this thing of taking away children. But I want to assure you, no social worker, has the appetite to want to just go and grab a child and take them away. There, there are lots of investigations and things have to go through court before you even get to that point. And for you to get to that point, there's lots of evidence, which is why when I was giving my presentation, I was saying about our culture sometimes, we think, when we hear it, our parents said it to us, I'm your, child, I'm your mother, I brought you into this world and I'm going to train you. You can't you can't repeatedly assault a child in the name of training because those investigations take place, they happen. But once parents know that they can't do that, they have to find other ways to bring up their children. If you don't know how, there are lots of parenting um, courses out there 
lots of services that we provide. And actually, before it gets to the point where social workers even do that, they would have tried all sorts of things to support the family. We're there to support, not to just go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peace. Um, I'm just going to say, uh, there's one last question here that I would ask um, Kemi to answer in 30 seconds. 30 seconds, Kemi. <laughs> um, this person has asked a question. How can I handle a situation where a lady was raped by her adopted father's friend from Nigeria? 30 seconds, Kemi. <laughs> The most important thing, 30 seconds, I'm going to do. The most important thing is you don't keep quiet about the case. Try to report to the uh, right authorities. Uh, perhaps get the mother aware of the situation. And if she's not uncooperative, sometimes it might be better to remove the person from the situation uh, so that there's not a repeated circle. And in so doing, you may need to construct some organization like charity organization within your area and uh, some safeguarding bodies that will help in setting up the, the girl in question. And I think it is by removing the child from that situation, because as it stands now, if the police are not gonna intervene, if, you're, if you don't think that you- 30 gonna... seconds over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And just on the last bit around perpetrator management, I'd just like to say to anyone who is out there, a man or a woman who you find yourself uncontrollably, and I know what I mean by that, you don't the act and you feel so guilty after. Uncontrollably, you have been abusive to your partner. Do you know that the services are out there to help you as well? There are lots of services out there. I'm going to put some, I'm going to put some up for those who are on Facebook who put the resources out there. People are actually recognizing that they have issues around anger management. There are services out there that would help you to manage your anger. Yes, you love your wife, you love your husband, you love your children, because don't forget domestic abuse is not just against mother, it's not just against wife partner on partner, it is parent on children, children on parent, friend to friend, domestic abuse, we need to realize that it is a, a whole gamut of all of the various relationships we have in our community. On that note, I'm going to say thank you so much to our distinguished panelists who did fantastic work today. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. Well done, well done, well done. It's okay for us to unmute our device and give them a clap in the house. Thank you so much. Well done to Dr. Ajayi, passionate delivery. And of course to Peace Raji, passionate delivery as well. Thank you so much. Well, well done, done yes. Peace. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. Give them all a well clap. Done, they peace. deserve it. <laughs> and of course, I'd like us to give, I'd like us to give a round of applause as well. For well <laughs> done for so putting this good. together. Uh, it is very, very much needed, very much needed. And of course, there's going to be a sequel to this. Uh, one of the sequels is one of the things that I think it was Peace that mentioned it earlier about the number of men. No, it was, uh, yeah, um, Kemi referred to a conversation that she had with Peace about the number of men who are in the hospital because they suffered a um, mental health breakdown because their partners have denied their children, denied them access to their children. Yes, I'm very much aware of that. My organization is planning a conference on black mental health matters, and that's going to be in September. Wow. I'm going to be sharing the date with them. I'll share the date with Kemi later, and we're inviting everybody here. So please join. We want to talk about Black mental health matters. Why do we have a disproportionate number of Black people in the mental health services, not as caregivers, not as clinicians, but as service users? What is the impact of racism? The impact of racism, of bullying. Of course, we're all very much aware of the Black Lives Matter. What is that impact on the mental health of black people? The last one is around the disproportionate number of vain people who have been affected by COVID. And one area we have not really talked about around COVID is, is a trauma. The effect of trauma of those who may have suffered from COVID, those who may have taken care of people who suffered from COVID, and those who may have lost loved ones due to COVID. It's a whole gamut of, you know, lots of conversations, but about Black mental health matters. What do we do to protect ourselves, to make sure that we stand, we stay afloat amidst all of these things going on around us? Thank you so much to everybody. And I'm just going to give our last one minute 
to Kenny, the convener of this conference. Well done, absolutely fantastic and very timely as well. So your one minute, Kenny. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited and I'm so grateful to all our wonderful speakers. Starting uh, from you, Reverend Lade, thank you for your job. Well done. And Dr. Ajayi, thank you so much. Dr. Bomo, thank you so much. Peace. Mm, peace to you. Thank you so, so very much. To all our audience, both home and abroad, I said thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. And I want to say a very big shout out to a better start Southern for funding this uh program it is with them that we can be able to do all this and i say thank you so much this is not the last of us we have a series of uh, another uh, one coming up on the 11th of september so please if you have registered to this event for this event and you're taking part now i'll plead with you to please add on to eventbrite and register for that as well it's going to be taking a new phase and we're going to be looking at Domestic violence and mental health in a in a, you know in a different light to what we have shared today. And if you have a question that you've not been able to answer, uh, ask today. Perhaps you want to bring that along as well when you are coming on the 11th of September. Sequel to this also is the uh, mentoring scheme that we have. If you have an issue that has affected you that has been mentioned tonight, please do contact myself uh, via info at climax. .org.uk and will provide you with a mentor to help and support you through the process uh, of getting help. And also is the fact that I want you to know wherever you are in a relationship or maybe someone close to you that is experiencing this, know that marriage, family relationship is all about mutual respect. When it is shortcoming, then it ceases to be a healthy relationship. Always create a healthy atmosphere, not just for yourself, but for others, there's care in sharing and you can't love and hate at the same time. Nobody can love you and hate you. If you, they claim they love you, they shouldn't hate you. Thank you so much for a wonderful time. My name is Kenny Tomide Johnson. I want to say thank you to my husband and my wonderful children who have been helping me have a background, sorting things out. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Ella. Wonderful girls. I love you all. And thank you so everyone and my lovely husband as well for giving me the grace to do all this and i say thank you to everyone kindness family help is always here to help and we just say thank you thank you thank you i finished i hope i, I didn't last my one minute <laughs> All right, thank you. I, I think that should bring us, so I'd like should to bring say, us to yes. the close of the workshop and up yes. to on the 11th of September. Follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. I'll be sharing further details. Thank you so much. Good night. And thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can stop broadcasting live on Facebook now. Okay, Can you stop the broadcast on Facebook, please? We have now. It's still on. It is still on. It's up now. It is still on. <laughs> My goodness. What have I done? You know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I think I have to do it here. Yeah. Yes, we should do it. This is what happens with technology. <laughs>